Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. My goal is to help you teach and study the scriptures with more relevancy, impact, and power. I appreciate you making me a part of your scripture study or your lesson prep today. And remember that the power in teaching with power comes from the scriptures themselves and the Spirit as you study and prepare with real intent. This is our third and final part of our study of the book of Revelation and is going to cover chapters 13 through 22. So let's begin with an activity. I'm going to name some famous contrasting pairs from popular culture. And I'll name one side of the pair, and then you come up with the contrast or the opposite. You ready? Here we go. Harry Potter. Voldemort, right? Uh, Batman. The Joker. Simba. Scar. Frodo Baggins. Sauron. Luke Skywalker. Darth Vader. Aslan from the Chronicles of Narnia. The White Witch. And Sherlock Holmes. Moriarty. You can see that as a culture, we are enamored with this good versus evil dynamic. It's all over our movies, our literature, our popular entertainment. We seem to connect with this idea on a deep, almost subconscious level. The reason I believe it's that way is because it reminds us of the great struggle that we've all been a part of ever since the pre-mortal existence. The book of Revelation is probably the best biblical manifestation of that particular idea. Through fictional characters and symbols and events, John portrays the great story of Earth's mortal existence played out in one fantastic narrative, each event slowly marching towards the inevitable outcome, the triumph of good and the defeat of evil. When you watch these kinds of movies or read those kinds of books, you want good to win. You expect good to win. Perhaps this resonates with us on such a profound level because deep in our hearts and spirits, we know that this is more than fiction. In fact, it's the most real thing of all. In the end, good will triumph over evil. So let's put this skill of recognizing contrasts into practice with the book of Revelation. And I'd like to do it with you as an activity. Your job is to find the pairs. I'll give you the references, and I want you to identify both sides of the contrast, the good versus the evil. Then your second task will be to match the pair with what it represents in reality. And you can either do that here on the screen or as a printout. I'll make it available to you as a handout for download if you wish to do it that way. So take a moment to look up the references and decide what the contrasting pairs are. So here are the pairs, the lamb versus the seven-headed dragon, the bride versus the whore of Babylon, the king of kings versus the beast, the candlesticks or olive trees versus the dragon-voiced lamb, the seal of the living God versus the mark of the beast or the number 666. The New Jerusalem versus the Great City Babylon. And let's take a closer look at each of these in turn to figure out what they represent. We've already covered the Lamb and the Dragon in previous videos, and we know that they represent Christ and Satan respectively. So A would go right there. Also, you've been introduced to the Bride of the Lamb in chapter 12, verse 1, and she makes another appearance later in Revelation 19. And she, of course, is a representation of the church. But we haven't met her counterpart yet. There's another woman, and she's not a bride. Let's read about her. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, 
Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Who does she represent? The world, or as Nephi put it, the great and abominable church. If Satan has a wife, she is it. She's described as a, a whore or a harlot. Why? Well, because she sold that which is most precious and sacred for money. She sold out. She wears scarlet and gold and pearls because those are her desires. She's the embodiment of lust, and she's drunk with the wine of fornication and the blood of the saints. She represents the worldly philosophy of eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's why Nephi writes, Behold, there are saved two churches only. The one is the church of the Lamb of God, and the other is the church of the devil. Wherefore, whoso belongeth not to the church of the Lamb of God, belongeth to that great church, which is the mother of abominations, and she is the whore of all the earth. So whether we describe ourselves as religious or not, we all belong to a church. You can worship in the chapel or at the club. You can eat and drink of the sacrament, or you can eat and drink at the party. You can love or lust, serve or steal, believe or blaspheme. In the end, there are only two churches, the church of the Lamb or the church of the world. So B would go right there. Next, 19, 11 through 16. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, who is this King of kings? That would be Christ and his royal government, his political power. He wears crowns and he rules with the iron rod of the word of God. Not just a king, but the king of kings, the highest authority. But in chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, we're introduced to another form of authority, the beast. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Now chapter 13 really introduces us to the three-pronged attack of the dragon's kingdom, embodied by the beast, a dragon-voiced lamb, and a great city. And each of these three represents a different tactic of evil and means of gaining influence. And let's see if we can determine what those are. The fact that the beast has the likeness of a leopard, a bear, and a lion signals that John is alluding to the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 3 through 6, different nations are represented by these animals. They're predatory animals just as many powerful nations prey on weaker ones. Their horns and crowns, and then also the words power, seat, great authority, make war, and overcome, suggest that this is the political arm of Satan's strategy. Here the influence comes from brute force, 
authority, and political power. Again, this beast has many heads and manifestations, yet the same evil heart. There are many examples of the damaging influence of this beast in the last century. The Nazism of Hitler, the repressive communist regimes of Stalin, Mao, Castro, and Kim Jong-un, the fanatic terrorism of Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and the Taliban, and we can even see the mark of the beast's influence manifest in the candidates and parties of democratic nations as well. The beast makes war with the principles of agency, religious freedom, and morality in order to maintain its grip of power and exploitation. So the match here would be C, Christ's reign as the king of kings versus evil political powers and governments. In chapter 11, verses 3 through 4, we talked about the candlesticks and the olive trees, and we know that they represent prophets or God's witnesses. But what's their counterpart? Chapter 13, 11 through 15, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Hmm, interesting symbol. Why a lamb with a dragon's voice? Well, who is the other lamb in the book of Revelation? It's Jesus. So this beast has the outward appearance of innocence, but his voice is that of the dragon. And what does he do with that voice? He deceives. What could he represent? False prophets. In fact, this beast is referred to by that name later in chapter 16, 13, 19, 20, and 20, verse 10. He represents the religious prong of the dragon's three-pointed attack. They are the false lambs or false Christs who may appear devout on the outside, but the well-tuned ear will recognize the dragon's voice whispering from its throat. Manifestations of the false prophets? Uh, this is the beast that inspires inquisitions, burnings at the stake, crusades, forced conversions, holy wars, and a whole slew of evil practices justified in the name of God and religious zeal. Currently, terrorist attacks carried out in the name of religion would be a noteworthy example of this beast in our day. Also, this beast is manifest in any person or organization that seeks to deceive others with an innocent exterior. The tobacco, alcohol, and pornography industries could be an example of this. The predator who exploits, the con man who swindles, the philanderer who seduces, the dragon-voiced lamb is alive and well in the 21st century. So D would go here. In the last video, we discussed the seal of the living God on the foreheads of the righteous. This represented the fact that they belong to God and His kingdom. Is there an equivalent on the dragon side? Yes. 13, 16 through 18. And He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Well, the wicked also have a mark on their forehead, the mark of the beast, or the number of his name. This is where we get the idea that the number 666 is associated with the devil. What's the meaning of that number? Well, in many ancient languages, letters had numerical equivalents, and uh, you see this practice in Roman numerals, or maybe when you were younger, you made up a, a secret code where numbers represented letters. So a person could represent their name in numbers if they wished. So 666 is just the numerical way of writing the name of the beast. And this makes sense in contrast. If the seal of the living God was the name of the Father, 
it would make sense that the mark of the beast constitutes the name of the adversary. Verse 17 basically tells us that's what it is. Whether that name be Satan or Lucifer or devil or accuser, uh, we don't know. One theory I find interesting comes from Moses 5.31, describing the account where Cain gives himself the title Mahan after he kills Abel. The footnote to that word tells us that mind, destroyer, and great one are possible meanings of the roots evident in Mahan. The name of the beast? Maybe, but just a thought. If I have his name on my forehead, who do I belong to? The devil. Now, don't take the mark too literally. I've heard a lot of interesting ideas on possible physical manifestations of the mark of the beast, but I don't buy it. Symbolic, not literal. Just like we don't actually write the name of God on our foreheads, the mark of the beast is likely not an actual mark, but just another way of showing the demarcation between good and evil. So the match for E is going to go right here. All right, our last contrast, the rival cities. First, let's go to 21, 10 through 16. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the name of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, twelve thousand furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Well, this is the city of God, the new Jerusalem, or more particularly, the celestial kingdom. It's made up of precious gems and crystal, both of which are pure, precious, reflect light, and never decay. The celestial kingdom will be a place of worth, purity, light, and eternal splendor. Each gate has the name of three of the twelve tribes of Israel, mirroring the pattern of the camp of Israel at the time of the Exodus. There are also twelve foundations to this wall, representing the twelve apostles. Usually, a building only has one foundation, but this city has twelve. Certainly, it's a strong wall. And along with the symbols of stars, eyes, and horns, the apostles are now foundations. They offer us security and support. And the city has an interesting shape, doesn't it? It says that its length and width and height are all equal. So what does it look like? A giant cube. The Holy of Holies in the tabernacle had these same square dimensions as well. Why? For something to be square suggests that it was exact and perfect, without any deviation, incongruity, or inequality. Well, such are the principles of the celestial kingdom. It's a place of perfection, where not only the city is exact, but also all those that dwell within it. In contrast, we have another city, 1810-13, through 13, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thyine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots, and slaves, and souls of men. The city is Babylon, or Satan's worldly kingdom. Here we have the third prong of Satan's attack, the economic or materialistic arm. If Satan can't corrupt us with political power or religious deceit, maybe he can get us with materialism. 
I believe that the United States is a prime example of a nation that is dominated by this particular attack. In Old Testament times, Babylon was the wealthiest, most opulent, and excessively materialistic cities of the age. Earlier in the chapter, verse 7 tells us that she, Babylon, lived deliciously. And verse 14 mentions all things which were dainty and goodly. We also hear of the buying and the selling of merchandise. And it's an intriguing list. It just seems to go on and on and on. And there's purpose in that. John wants you to almost get tired of reading the list. And isn't that the way of Babylon? There's always something else to buy. Enough is never enough. Babylon must continually offer something new to keep them coming back to buy and buy again. They operate under the philosophy that there is nothing that money can't buy. And then he ironically throws that last item on the list. And you can almost hear the sarcasm in his voice. And the souls of men. Everything is for sale, even the souls of men. Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? In Babylon, people are in the business of selling souls, and in the end, they will come up on the losing side of that equation. So the match in this case would have to be celestial glory, represented by the New Jerusalem, and worldly glory, represented by Babylon. So F would be the final match here. Now, as you look at that handout, I hope you can see the clear choices that John has laid before our eyes. The opposing pieces of good and evil are set before us like a giant chessboard. The question for you and I still remains, which side are you going to play for? Now, moving to a different activity, I have something I want you to try here. The book of Revelation gives us a good outline for the end times. If you had to put the following events in chronological order, how would you do it? I'm going to include this activity also as a handout available for download, if you're interested in using it for yourself or in a classroom setting. A link is going to be available in the video description below. So here they are. As we go through the answers, I'm going to share some thoughts from Revelation on a number of these events. I understand that there are many other events that I could have included on this list. It's not comprehensive, but it does capture the basic timeline for the end of times. So number one, the apostasy. Prophecies about the great apostasy are all over the book of Revelation. But we saw it particularly in chapter 12 with uh, the woman fleeing into the wilderness. Number two, the restoration. Jump to chapter 14, verses 6 through 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Well, this angel has been identified by prophets as Moroni, having the fullness of the everlasting gospel to restore to the world in the latter days. Number three, the sign of the Son of Man that we find in Doctrine and Covenants 8893 that we discussed back in chapter eight, along with number four, the half hour of silence. Now, number five, the battle of Armageddon. I'll talk more about this one later in the video, but sometime before the appearing of the Savior, there will be a great battle where evil will finally be vanquished. This destruction of evil can be seen in many places in Revelation, but specifically chapters 16 through 19. Number six, Christ appearing to the world in glory. And we already read these verses back in the first activity, but let's take a look at them again. The first time Christ came to the earth, he came as a baby and then a humble carpenter and a teacher. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey in the spirit of peace and invitation, and the people rejected him and crucified him. This time he comes on a war horse as judge and conqueror of evil. He wears red this time. Why red? Well, Isaiah offers some insight on that question, and it's a little chilling. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? His answer, 
I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. The image is that he will trample and tread down the wicked, and their blood will splash on his clothing, dyeing them red. I know that's a tough image to reconcile with the merciful and loving Savior that we're all familiar with. But I don't believe that this is a literal event. I don't think that Jesus is actually going to trample people to death. It's a symbol. He's coming in justice. Those that have refused time and time again his outstretched arm of mercy are now going to face his judgment. The wicked are going to be removed from the earth, and they are going to spend the millennium in spirit prison rather than with the Lamb of God. Number seven, Satan is bound. Chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Satan will no longer have any influence on our world. I feel that this prophecy could be taken both literally and figuratively. Satan's influence will be removed from the earth, physically. I believe that he will have no physical or spiritual presence here. On the other hand, I like how Nephi says it in 1 Nephi 22:26. And because of the righteousness of his people, Satan has no power. Wherefore, he cannot be loosed for the space of many years. For he hath no power over the hearts of the people. For they dwell in righteousness, and the Holy One of Israel reigneth. That's another way that Satan is bound. Because of their righteousness, he has no power over them. He can't get to their hearts because nobody listens to him. In that sense, we can bind Satan right now. Just stop listening to him, and he'll be bound and cast away from your life. Next, number eight, the resurrection of the just. Nine, the millennium. And ten, the resurrection of the unjust. And these events are described in chapter 24 through 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received the mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So therefore, the righteous will be resurrected first. We know that celestial and terrestrial people will be resurrected at this time and enjoy the thousand years of peace with Christ as their king. And then at the end of the millennium, those who have lived a telestial law and spent the millennium in spirit prison will then be brought forth and resurrected. Leading us to number 11, Satan loosed for a little season, and number 12, the battle of Gog and Magog. And we see these events in 20, 7 through 8. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. I'm not going to go into great detail on these prophecies and I don't wish to be speculative. I believe our understanding of them is limited anyway. But apparently, Satan will begin to have influence once again near the end of the millennium. How and why that exactly takes place, I'm not sure. But much like the war in heaven in the pre-mortal existence, this will not be a physical but spiritual conflict. And I'm sure that the conflict will be over the same question. Will you stand behind the wisdom of the plan of the Father and accept his son's sacrifice for your sins? Or will you rebel with Lucifer and use your eternal agency to turn away from God. However that happens, the final outcome is certain. Satan and his followers, the sons of perdition, will finally be cast out of our presence once and for all. 
And this paves the way for number 13, the final judgment described to us in 20, 12 through 15. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. All must be judged according to their works out of the books that have been carefully kept by the angels through the ages. A quick note here on the judgment. I like the phrase that Doctrine and Covenants 137 adds to our understanding of the judgment. Verse 9 reads, For I, the Lord, will judge all men according to their works, comma, according to the desire of their hearts. I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful that I will not only be judged by my works, but that my desires will count for something too. We're all familiar with the saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and I do believe that's true. But according to this verse, so is the road to heaven. The final event on our list then is number 14, the earth receives its celestial glory. And the description of this event comprises chapters 21 and 22, and we're going to go into more depth on those chapters later. Well, a bit of a break here before we move on to the final portion of the lesson. Remember the good versus evil pairs that I mentioned at the beginning of the lesson? I have a new question for you. How did those stories end? What was the resolution of that conflict? Harry Potter defeats Voldemort. Batman prevails and the Joker is put into prison. Scar falls off the cliff in a fight with Simba and survives, but he's killed by the hyenas instead. Frodo destroys the ring and Sauron crumbles. Darth Vader, in a way, is eventually destroyed by Luke as he once again becomes Anakin Skywalker in a type of deathbed repentance, but he's destroyed. The White Witch is killed by Aslan in the Great Battle, and then Moriarty falls to his death at Reichenbach Falls in a fight with Sherlock Holmes. So in popular culture, good almost always defeats evil. We feel inside of us that it ought to end that way. Well, let's see how the book of Revelation turns out. The question is the same. How does it end? And I invite you to take a quick look at the following verses to see what happens to evil. I'm not going to lead you through each verse, but I have a feeling that you're going to get the message. So I invite you to pause and read these verses. And the message is really quite simple, isn't it? Evil loses, good triumphs over all. The beast will no longer conquer, the dragon-voiced lamb will no longer deceive, the harlot of Babylon will no longer seduce, and the great city will no longer hawk its wares. And the dragon? Well, instead of chaining others, he'll be chained. Instead of spreading darkness, he'll be enveloped by it. And instead of dragging others into the pit, he himself is going to be cast there. It makes one wonder why anybody would consciously choose the losing side. And I'd like to include an interesting point on how this loss and destruction is going to take place. In the past, I used to picture the second coming as this literal giant fire falling from heaven and burning wicked people and purifying the earth. I don't think I see it that way anymore. Now, I guess it could be that, but I don't believe that it's likely. There's a symbol that we haven't examined closely yet, from Revelation 16:16, 16, 16. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Armageddon means Hill of Megiddo. Now, Megiddo was a very strategically placed city in northern Israel. It guarded an important pass in the Carmel mountain range and was really vital to controlling the whole area. Because of that, many battles were fought there. And Revelation tells us that before the second coming, a great battle is going to be fought there. Now, you can probably guess how I'm going to interpret this. Often, this prophecy is taken literally, and many believe that an actual major battle is going to take place at that very spot in the future. Me? I'm not so sure. It's possible. I, I don't deny that it could happen. 
uh, a major world conflict playing out in the Middle East is really not too far-fetched of an idea. However, I think John is just playing off the reputation of Megiddo as being a place of battle and conflict for a literary effect. The people of John's day would have recognized that name as being associated with war. Also, the way that modern warfare is fought nowadays doesn't lend itself very neatly to the idea of a large number of nations sending their troops into one location to have it out. I believe that Armageddon symbolizes all conflict and violence throughout the world. And in that sense, Armageddon is happening right now. It's in the Middle East. It's in Afghanistan, Sudan, Nigeria, and Myanmar. It's being fought in Syria and in the drug wars of Mexico and Colombia. Armageddon is whenever mankind is engaged in war and conflict. Another point that should be made. Who is going to be fighting who in this last final battle? Is it a battle between good and evil, with good finally vanquishing the bad? Not exactly. Certainly good is in conflict with evil, and the two forces are going to face off at times. But Armageddon seems to be a different kind of battle. Who's fighting who? Read the following verses to see if you can figure it out. 1716. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast... These shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. So who destroys the harlot of Babylon? The beast. The beast turns on her, and destroys her. 13.10 He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Again, those that live the law of the sword are going to be destroyed by it. Nephi probably says it most clearly in chapter 22, 13 through 14. And the blood of that great and abominable church, which is the whore of all the earth, shall turn upon their own heads, for they shall war among themselves, and the sword of their own hands shall fall upon their own heads, and they shall be drunken with their own blood. And every nation which shall war against thee, O house of Israel, shall be turned one against another. So who destroys the wicked? The wicked. Just like the great final battle of the Book of Mormon. It wasn't a fight between good and evil, but evil and evil. Evil consumes itself. Satan's kingdom self-implodes. Perhaps God doesn't even need to do anything to destroy the wicked. They kind of take care of it themselves leaving only the righteous behind. Probably my favorite place in the scriptures to see this comes from another prophet who prophesied about the end of the world, Joel, a book that Revelation certainly draws inspiration from. Joel doesn't refer to Armageddon, but a different, equally compelling location. He says in Joel 3.2, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. What is the Valley of Jehoshaphat? Well, this is a fascinating story from the Old Testament that's rarely mentioned. It's buried in Second Chronicles chapter 20. I won't take the time to read through it verse by verse, but I encourage you to do so. I'll summarize it. Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah when he receives word that many nations have decided to band together to attack them. They realize that they have no means of defending themselves against such an enemy, and they turn to the Lord in prayer and fasting. The prophet Jehaziel comes and says, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves. Stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. So with great faith, the people march towards this oncoming army, not knowing how it's going to all play out. And when they come up over the hill to meet their enemy in the valley of Jehoshaphat, what do they see? A field full of dead soldiers. The battle is already over. What happened is that as the different nations started to march towards Jerusalem, they began to argue with each other over who got what spoils. Their arguing turns to violence, and they end up fighting with each other to the death. And by the time Jehoshaphat gets there, the battle is over, 
and they've destroyed each other. I believe that this will be the same outcome for Armageddon. Evil will destroy evil, and all Zion will need to do is sit back and watch. On an even deeper figurative meaning, we could say that any person engaged in evil behavior usually ends up destroying themselves, their own personal Armageddon. The criminal, the warmonger, the addict, the dishonest, they almost always bring upon themselves their own destruction. I don't think God hardly ever has to punish people for their behavior. Their own behavior punishes them. They merely experience the natural consequences of their bad choices. So the personal warning for all of us here, are you heading for your own Armageddon or Valley of Jehoshaphat? If so, turn around, change sides. Come to Zion, come to Zion, for your coming Lord is nigh. Come to Zion, come to Zion, for your coming Lord is nigh. So that's how it ends for the wicked. But what about the righteous? Well, let's approach this with a search activity. If I were teaching a class, I'd break this up into individual assignments or groups and have them search for the outcomes promised the righteous. 19, 7 through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. If any of you are married, do you remember what the day of your wedding was like? Or have you ever attended a wedding? How do you prepare for that day? Especially if you're the bride. My wife prepared herself for hours to be ready for the wedding. Every hair had to be in the right place. The makeup, just so. The, the dress, carefully selected and meticulously fit. Why? She wanted to look and be her very best for that special occasion. For me. And she was radiant, beautiful. If you'd have turned the lights off, she would have glowed in the dark. I'd never seen her look quite like that before. Well, that's the way that we should feel about meeting the Savior. Hopefully, we live our lives in such a way that we look our absolute best for the Savior when He comes. And what is it that we wear to the wedding? Our righteousness. Like John says in verse 8, the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. I like to imagine a giant locker room in the sky. Each one of us has a locker with our name in gold letters above it. And inside it is what we will wear to the second coming. And it's our righteousness. Each day of our lives, we're weaving threads into our wedding garment through our obedience, sacrifice, and service. And if our lives have been full of these principles, when we open that locker, for the women, there'll be a beautiful wedding dress. And for men, a really handsome-looking three-piece suit. However... If our lives have not been full of obedience and sacrifice and service, how horrified we might be to see what we had to wear. Would you feel comfortable going to the wedding of the Savior in a pair of shorts and a tank top? Or worse, but those that are prepared, they're going to enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb. And what will we feast on? Truth. Christ is the waiter and truth is on the menu. You can see this in Doctrine and Covenants 101, 32-35. Have you ever had a question that you wanted answered? Something about this life or the world or mortality that you didn't understand? Christ is going to serve you those truths. There'll be no more mysteries. Everything will become clear. What an amazing meal. Don't want to miss that. Next, Revelation 21, 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And then in 22.4, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. So did you hear that? We get to meet God and Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that moment? We will get to spend time with both of them. One-on-one -on -one time with our Father in heaven and our older brother, Jesus Christ. I don't think we realize just how much we miss our heavenly parents. But what a reunion it's going to be when the veil is dropped and we get to see them again. And how do you think that you're going to react when you meet your Savior and touch the wounds in His side and hands and feet? 
Then Revelation 21.4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. This is one of my favorite scriptures of all time. For sure, it would be on my top five list. We cry a lot of tears in this life. Tears of physical pain, tears of grief, tears of guilt, tears of longing, tears of disappointment, tears of loneliness. What does Christ promise to do? To wipe them away from our eyes. Maybe you've wiped away the tears of loved ones, but you felt inadequate because you couldn't wipe them away from their hearts. Christ is going to do both. There'll be no more reason to cry. All the things that make mortality difficult and painful will be gone. No more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. There really is a happily ever after for us if we remain faithful. You may be tried and tested by the tragedies and the terribleness of life. But just as a parent lovingly wipes away the tears from their child's cheek, so too will Christ wipe yours away. All pain has an end. Even Christ was able to say, it is finished of his pain. I promise that one day, so will you. Revelation 21.5 And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. All things are going to be made new. This world will be changed. It's going to be as glorious as the sun. If the glory of the telestial kingdom is beyond our mortal comprehension, what does that tell you about the glory of the celestial? We're no longer going to live in a fallen world, but a world even greater than Eden. Do you love the way that it feels to move into a new home or drive a new car or wear new clothes? Wait until you get a new world and a new life and a new body and a new glory. It's going to be amazing. Revelation 21, 6. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Well, we get to drink of the water of life freely. When Nephi saw a similar symbol in the dream his father Lehi saw, an angel explained that the living fountain of waters represented the love of God. We all thirst for love. And in this life, we've probably all tasted too much of the water of bitterness and loneliness or hatred. In God's kingdom, we will drink daily from the love of our Father in heaven and feel and know that we belong. 21.7 He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. We get to inherit all things. We will become heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. What will we inherit? His truth, his power, his love, his immortality, his kingdom, his presence, his understanding, his very nature. Perhaps greatest of all, we will be like him, gods and goddesses, the thing that he desired most for us from the beginning, for us to be like him. And 22.2, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Not only will we drink of the water of life, but we will eat from the tree of life. And don't you love that there are twelve different kinds of fruit on one tree? Maybe that tells us that the fruits of God's love are many and various. There's so much that he wants us to enjoy, and he offers a huge assortment of blessings and gifts for us to enjoy for eternity. We won't even have to wait for the fruit to come into season. It gives fruit all year long. It's always available. And the leaves are for healing. We'll be healed from all the hardships and tragedies that we've suffered in life. And here, as you look at this list, I have a question for you to ponder. Which of these blessings do you most look forward to, and why? So, has the book of Revelation helped you to make a decision? I really pray that I've been able to help make its message plainer for you. You and I have a choice to make. And as you make your choice, please remember that the outcome has already been determined since the foundation of the world. 
just as we expect Harry Potter to defeat Voldemort and Simba to overpower Scar and Frodo to conquer Sauron, so too will the Lamb overcome the dragon. No matter how powerful or intimidating or in control the dragon and the beast and the harlot seem to be, they will lose. The Lamb will prevail. So when the earthquake shakes and the stars fall and the beast rises and the dragon snaps and the merchants call and the four horsemen stalk and the dragon-voiced lamb whispers and the smoke from the bottomless pit billows in our eyes, we may rest assured that it is all temporary. You could sum up the message of the entire book of Revelation in one simple statement. Choose Christ and all will be well. And I'll conclude with the final prayer of John in chapter 22, verse 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. I've spoken with a lot of students and members over the years that feel trepidation and fear and uncertainty when they think about the second coming. I'm not really sure why. Christ's return will be the most glorious and phenomenal event the world will know in the last days. It's something to look forward to, to pray for, and to anticipate with joy. So I echo John's sentiments. Let him come. Let the end begin so that the real beginning can start. So, Lord, come. And to that prayer, I say, Amen. And that, my friends is the New Testament. We did it. You did it. I want to thank all of you for going on this journey of faith with me this year. It has been a privilege to share my thoughts and feelings about the New Testament with you. Thank you for the encouragement, all the kind and gracious comments, and the chance to spend each week with you in the scriptures. What started out almost as a a second thought has turned into something really amazing in my life. I love being able to share my passion for the scriptures with so many of you around the world. I hope and pray that your testimony of the Word of God, and particularly the New Testament, has grown and strengthened. A lot of you have asked if I plan to continue into next year with the Book of Mormon. Well, I'm happy to let you know that, yes, we're going to just continue right on into the next amazing book of scripture. I love the Book of Mormon just as much as I love the New Testament. And I can't wait to share my thoughts and insights on that great book of Scripture with you as well. So let's keep on teaching with power right on into the new year. If you'd like a printable lesson plan or you'd like to purchase the slides that were used to make the video, you'll find links to those websites at teachingwithpower.com. If you haven't yet, please like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, get out there and teach with power.